everyone, and welcome back to another Minecraft tutorial video! My name is Shells, and today we're going to be talking about how to make gradients in your Minecraft builds. Um, now, just like with circles, I know that there are already tons of tutorials and tools out there to help you make gradients in Minecraft, but I thought I'd put in my two cents and explain some of my thoughts on gradients. I'll be going over some of the basic color theories behind what makes gradients work, and then I'll be touching on how to apply them in a build. Now I'm just going to be covering basics, so don't expect anything too horribly mind-blowing. I'm mostly making this video for those who don't even know where to begin when it comes to gradients. So to start off, let's talk about colors. There are three main aspects to look at when determining a color. Hue, saturation, and value. So let's break it down. Hue is where you are on the color spectrum, you know, be it red, green, blue, that sort of thing. Saturation is how vibrant, strong, or bright the color is. The more desaturated you get, the more gray it becomes, the more saturated it is, the stronger the color. You get the gist. Value is how light or dark your color is. Um, so adding white to a color is called a tint, and adding black to a color is called a shade. Pretty simple, right? You combine all three of these to get where your color is. So when you're looking to make a gradient, you have to pay really, really close attention to all three of these aspects. You can theoretically pick any two colors and make a gradient between the two. But you have to look at what all is changing between the two colors. Are you shifting hue, saturation, value? Many times you are shifting all three to make it through a full gradient. And the important thing is that as you shift from one color to the other, each step has to move incrementally and has to stay within the bounds of your starting color and your end color. What I mean by that is, uh, let's say you're trying to get from this dark, desaturated green to white. Well, you might be tempted to throw in some of these lime colors. Yeah, yeah, that, that looks good. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly the value is about right. But what you'll notice is that we have a desaturated color to begin with and a desaturated color to end with, so it doesn't actually make sense to have a saturated color in the middle. It's like if I were counting from 30 to 50 and randomly threw in a 70 in the middle. It's going to stand out it isn't part of your gradient. Now that isn't to say that you can't make this work, but what it means is that you have to make the gradient twofold. You're not jumping from this green straight to white. You are jumping from this green to the saturated green to white. There's a difference. That means that incrementally, the steps in here would have to be slowly gaining in saturation as it approaches the lime color. And then from here, as the lime approaches white, you would have to be desaturating it. Now, theoretically, you can add any number of quote-unquote points to your gradient. Um, so, you know, this is a three-point gradient. You could, you know, shift between different colors and have more points. Um, but when you are starting out with a gradient, uh, I would honestly stick to a few main colors and leave it at that. Usually, you know, two or three is a good starting spot for making gradients. The tricky thing is that when you're limited to whatever blocks you have available to you in Minecraft, oftentimes there is no smooth transition from this green to white. Uh, sometimes you have to add in the saturated green in order to complete the gradient. It's one of the big hiccups to making a gradient sometimes, is you have to look at the blocks that are available to you and then figure out how to get from one point to another. Um, you often can't do just straight up gradients. Saturation in particular is a big pitfall with Minecraft blocks, since you usually have to either drop in saturation in order to shift from one color, like you know going from this lime to this teal, you have to use this kind of block palette, which 
is very desaturated compared to these two. Um, or you have to do that thing where you are adding in saturation. Uh, you'll find that a lot with gradients is be prepared for that. <laughs> There's also the question of how quickly can you shift between one color to another? Basically, how large of increments can you get away with uh, having between your colors? And that can be really hard to nail down. Sometimes you think you have a gradient that works, but then when you put it into your build, it looks too much like freckles. Usually I try to find the absolute closest color I can to the previous color, so it's usually better for a gradient to be as gradual as you could possibly make it. That being said, Minecraft has this bad habit of having a whole bunch of blocks that are nearly identical in color with such minor differences as to make them a little bit redundant to use in a gradient. You know, like all of these teals, for instance. And while you want your gradient to be gradual, if you're not really changing the color, like, at all, it can hardly be called a gradient anymore. There are, of course, subtle differences between each of these blocks, and you can have a gradient with just these blocks. Um, it will just be a lot more subtle of a gradient than something that's jumping like this to that. And sometimes when you're making a gradient, you have to kind of uh, pick a block that works the best in your gradient and abandon all of the others just to make the gradient work. And uh, going back to our freckles over here, you'd actually be surprised by what leaps you can get away with sometimes. Yes, this looks a little bit dramatic from up close, but as you back away from it, it actually doesn't look too bad. So distance from the gradient is important to note, as is how front and center the gradient is. If all you have to look at is the gradient, it can be easy to spot little problems in it. But if you have a more complex build with other things to draw your attention away from the gradient, the more it will start to blend. Now before we move on from your choice in colors, I really want to take a second to talk about a common pitfall I see in tons of people doing gradients. I'm going to talk about hue, that thing, and specifically what it means to have a warm color versus a cool color. You see, it's pretty easy to pick a hue, like say blue, and you're like, awesome, I have blue, and you gather all of your blue blocks and stuff them all together because they're all blue. But within your blue spectrum, there are actually subtle differences. Every color has either a warm version or a cool version. For our blue example, I'm going to draw your attention to this blue concrete block and this lapis block. Objectively, they seem pretty similar in color. But one is a cool blue and the other is a warm blue. So what's the difference? Well, if you look at this little slider of colors, cool blues are closer to the side bordering purple and the warm blues are closer to the border with the cyans and greens. So looking at our lapis here, there's, it's got more of a greenish teal undertone, while the concrete looks almost purple. And almost every color has a similar warm variant and a cool variant. The easiest way to discern the two for any given color is, does it look like it has more blues and purples in it? It's probably a cool color. If it has more orange and yellow, it's a warm color. This is one of the reasons why it's kind of hard to combine any of the light blue blocks you find in Minecraft with the packed ice blocks. Um, the light blue hue found in the ice is much more of a cool variant, whereas all of the light blue blocks are more of a cyan. Um, and they kind of mesh, but they also kind of don't. Same thing goes for like emerald blocks. You get either emerald or lime. There, there really is no in between here. Uh, and emerald is very much a cool color. Lime is very much a warm color. Usually people don't tend to get this too wrong when working with colored blocks. The main time I see this abused is actually when people are working with the gray spectrum. Too often, people aren't thinking about the colors of their grays because they think that it's all achromatic and therefore hue doesn't really apply to them. So next thing you know, you see things like this where people are combining light gray wool with clay. So I would advise you to pay really close attention. 
there is a difference. Um, the cool grays tend to look more blue and the warm grays tend to look more beige. Um, I've gone ahead and sorted between the two. So we have uh, warm grays over here and cool grays over here. This isn't a full complete list. I cannot go through every single block and tell you what is warm and what is cool, but I figured having some examples here should show you the differences. Um, on the warm grays, you have things like all of the light gray uh, variants, color variants, um, things like dead coral blocks, acacia wood, even deep slate falls under this list. On the cool side of the spectrum, we have just regular gray for the color spectrum. Um, so, you know, this is gray wool, gray concrete, um, basalt and smooth basalt. Clay is definitely very, very, uh, very, very cool. It's more of a, almost a light blue color. Um, but andesite, blackstone, uh, cyan terracotta, and then you have the the cool whites, which is snow, diorite, and the white concrete blocks. So you can see there's a big spectrum. Um, some of the blocks are a little bit more towards the middle. Like I sometimes have troubles placing where stone and gravel go. Um, I would argue that gravel has almost pinkish tones, which makes it more warm, but honestly, it could go either way. Now I will say that sometimes mixing warm colors with cool colors can be acceptable. If your gradient is moving from a, a warm color to a cool color and your blocks fall into that gradient somewhere, you know, that the gradient spectrum, then it's fine. Um, but then if you have a whole bunch of cool colors and you stuff in a warm color, it, it may or may not stand out and it would be better for you to keep warm colors with warm colors and cool colors with cool colors. Cool? Cool. You also have to know that little sins tend to be forgivable, especially when you're limited by whatever blocks Minecraft has available. Chances are you're not going to find the perfect block you need. Often I'll find myself with two colors that are on the same spectrum, they have the right saturation levels, but I need some sort of bridge or block in between, and I just can't find it. Um, and you kind of have to, uh, you know, put in something that works value-wise, but may or may not work saturation-wise. Um, like this poor desaturated granite on the floor pattern I used in my most recent build. And depending on just how off it is, you can usually get away with using it in the gradient anyway. And admittedly, trying to find just the right blocks to use in Minecraft can be extremely difficult. One of the things that Minecraft does ha have though is an awful lot of the blocks that are similar in color, but with ever so slightly different tones or textures, like our teals back over there. And some blocks that work well in one gradient, uh, you may find don't work at all in another gradient. Sometimes it depends on what colors are around a particular block. Dark prismarine can look either more green or more teal, depending on what's around it. It kind of has undertones of both. Honestly, sometimes the best way to make a gradient in Minecraft is to lay out a whole bunch of similar looking blocks and try them out in your gradient. Um, and then you can swap out any that just aren't working for you or otherwise tweak it until you find something that ultimately makes you happy. But you have to come into the game knowing that some colors simply don't exist or don't have enough similar colors to work properly in a gradient. Something you can kind of do to cheat certain colors is to layer semi-transparent blocks in front of other blocks to try to blend certain colors together. Um, so things like adding the stained glass in front of a block or hiding the awful texture of uh, the kelp block, the stupid white lines that ruin it every time by uh, putting spruce leaves in front of it. Things like that. Um, Often I like using these really, really thin blocks uh, because they look very much like it's flush with the block underneath. Um, but 
it's, you know, it is still a block on top, but you almost can't even tell. So I like using the Skulk Vein um, and Glow Lichen for doing things like this to really blend together uh, certain hues and colors. And yeah, having the really thin blocks is usually a better idea than having full blocks on top, just because uh, doing the stained glass technique in particular is really difficult to pull off, um, just because you get a different view if you're viewing it at an angle. Um, just because of how much depth is there. And it can also cast some really weird shadows and stuff sometimes in your gradient, um, which is never a good idea. Um, but you can occasionally get it to work, but don't always count on it. <laughs> now, the final thing I want to point out about choosing colors in Minecraft specifically is that Minecraft tends to add another factor into your colors, you know, besides the basic hue, saturation, and value. And that is texture. Um, most blocks in Minecraft are not one solid color. They have multiple colors mixed together on a single block in order to create texture. Um, for instance, it can be difficult to define the value of, say, cobblestone, um, just because it has some really dark grays to make the cracks and some really light grays for the rocks. Um, and then you have blocks like the glazed terracotta blocks, which flat out have completely different colors in them, sometimes complementary colors, like this poor orange and cyan here. Um, <laughs> uh, and if you're having troubles figuring out exactly what a block's value or overall color is, the general solution is to back away. As you do so, your eyes tend to blend it all together into one color for you. And sometimes you have to consider whether your blocks are viewed from a distance or not. If your texture is too distracting from up close, and your player can only view the build from up close, you might want to swap out the textured block for something else. The opposite can be true as well, where there's something that looks alright up close, but can make some weird distracting lines and such as you back away. And to be honest, for similar reasons, I tend to be one that avoids putting a highly textured block amidst a lot of smooth blocks. Um, even if it's technically correct on hue, value, and saturation, if you have a bunch of solid, uh, solid smooth blocks and you stuff in a really textured block, it's going to stand out at least a little bit. It's also why I tend to avoid using ore blocks at all in my gradients. Admittedly, it's not always the worst option, and you know, you can usually get them to work, but they're still more difficult to work with than not. Now, again, just like the rest of the gradients, you can transition from a smooth block to a slightly more textured block to a slightly more textured block until you get into some of the really crunchy ones, um, and that usually works just fine. You can even get some really subtle gradients in a build just by changing the texture of your blocks. And I will say, don't be afraid to go out of your comfort zone when picking blocks. I know when I was first building, I always had this rule about not using quote unquote unnatural block types in my builds. I built the stone buildings out of stone and the wood buildings out of wood and utterly refuse to mix the two. And to be fair, there can be something really jarring about seeing an obviously wooden texture in the middle of something that's supposed to be made out of metal or something. But honestly, I found that when I overcame my initial reservations, I got a lot better at making gradients. Now I find myself, you know, throwing in pumpkins or bees nests or melons uh, into a build just to challenge myself. And so long as you're not changing the textures too dramatically, it usually doesn't matter. All right, so I've basically covered everything you need to know about picking your blocks to use in a gradient. So let's talk about how to apply them. The first thing you have to ask yourself is, what is the purpose of my gradient? There are two main reasons to have a gradient in your build. 
The first and most common reason for having a gradient is to add your own shading to a build. So just like a sculptor painting their work, even though there's already natural light and shadow, they will tend to make their sculptures more dynamic by darkening the shadows and brightening the highlights. Um, the other reason to have a gradient is to change your local color. Local color is the actual color of an object before shading gets applied. So if we look at this picture of an apple, most of the local color is red, but in some areas it shifts to more of a yellow color. So we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, gradients that change in local color first. The main places you would use this is for things like, let's say you want to make a building look more weathered in a spot, or you're making custom terrain and you want your grass to look more natural with some yellow or brown patches. Usually when you're changing the local color, you have your main color for most of the build, but then you pick spots that you're going to be shifting to the other color. So I'll go ahead and demonstrate this with my grass texturing example. I went ahead and assigned all of the, uh, the blocks of my gradient to all of the brushes that I have down below. And we have this big flat green grass over here, so I'm going to add some yellow blobs to it. I don't want these to be perfectly circular blobs, so we're going to make them deformed and modeled. From there, we can start to make a proper gradient going between uh, all of the different colors in my gradient. Um, and something that you'll notice is that uh, I'm not making perfect lines or anything like that. If anything, I'm trying to make little tendrils and such shooting out. Um, and you know, you can change the, the look of your shapes depending on what look you're trying to go for. Like if you're wanting to do cracks for like a building or something, make them into crack shapes and build up from there. Honestly, the more deformed your shapes are, the better your gradient is going to look at the end. All right, so now I've gone ahead and I have all of my colors put in for my gradient here. Um, but you'll notice that it is not blended like at all. So let's go ahead and talk about what we do to blend these different colors. So the main thing we're trying to do is we're trying to get rid of these really, really sharp lines between each step of the gradient. And the way we combat that is with randomness. So what we do is we start with uh, our, let's start with our brighter yellow color. And we're going to blend this line here between the two. What we do is we first take our brighter color and we're going to randomly place stuff away from that line. And you can, you, you try to do it where the further away you get from the line, the sparser your placements go. So you get really a lot of placements around here. And then as you move away from the line, you get less and less. You do just like pinpricks of blocks over there. So you, you go through, you do that for your brighter colors, and then you're going to come through and do the same thing again with the bamboo going this way. So we'll do the same thing over here. Generally speaking, the further away my colors get from my starting line, uh, the more blended my whole gradient will look, especially as you, they start to infringe upon some of the other lines here. It will actually make your gradient look more blended in the end. So don't be afraid to, you know, poke the sponge all the way over here into the bamboo. You, you can mix the two and it's actually recommended to do so. And we're going to go ahead and do that with all of these layers. So next I move the bamboo going this way, um, et cetera, et cetera, until you've fully blended all of the colors together. Something else to keep in mind when you're doing this is try your best to avoid patterns. Um, and it can be something like having the same shape, you know, twice in a row. That tends to stand out as being a pattern instead of being randomness. But I find that even if I'm doing this where I'm just kind of in one spot, all of my blocks will reach a certain point um, and then 
you'll notice that there's a defined line of exactly where I was. So you kind of want to breach some of that to avoid making patterns. So you can, you know, move further away in some places and then it looks a little bit less like a pattern. This one still, it looks almost like a line going there. So I'm just going to add one that's like way out there just to break up the pattern a little bit more. in mind that you are always at liberty to say that melon block is way too saturated and I don't like it so I'm going to replace it with the lime terracotta block so uh bam uh and I think I'm going to similarly change the wool out all right, we've got our gradient nice and blended now. This gradient is a little bit on the extreme side. Uh, I pushed it to a very bright yellow. Um, so I'm not sure how much I would actually recommend using this particular gradient in a build, uh, especially since most of these blocks you can't put grass on top of unless you're using um, special mods or whatever that let you put grass on anything so you know I can't just spam ferns like anywhere um but the other thing is that it's also very very textured and that is quite apparent from a distance that's actually like hurting your eyes a little bit looking back there so I wouldn't suggest using this particular gradient in your build but besides that <laughs> The concept is still very much the same. Uh, you get the general gist. A lot of these blobs wouldn't be quite so close together. You'd have them more separated. So that way you get more of the full gradient in between. Um, and you, you would do that throughout your build or what have you. Um, so this is how you do a local color change. Now doing shading is a, a little bit different. So when you're doing shading, you're not just picking random blobs to make the gradient shift between. Um, you're using the gradient to increase the contrast of your build. So usually for shading, I tend to find myself picking a local color that I'm using and then finding a shade of that local color and then finding a tint. Uh, now you don't have to go all the way from black to white and in fact a lot of gradients should not be this extreme but I do like to have the full uh the full extent of the gradient laid out just so that way I know what's there so most of the time you won't see quite that dramatic <laughs> of a shift but the first thing you tend to do when you're making a, a shading gradient is you're actually going to make a gradient that covers this entire build from top to bottom. And generally speaking, your gradient is going to move from darker colors at the bottom, lighter colors at the top. 
This is because most of the time, especially if your build is outside, your light source is coming from bing, the sun. And the sun is always in the sky, even if it's like down lower, it's still above eye level for you. The only time you won't find that is uh, if you're having an artificial lighting. Like this, uh, this build here is lit by the lava from down below. So it actually reverses going from dark blocks at the top down to lighter. Um, similarly, uh, you'll notice with this example, uh, because my source of light is orange colored, my, uh, my gradient is fading to orange instead of fading to white. But generally speaking, if you have the sun as your main light source, you're going to be fading to a white. So what I end up doing here is I've got all of my colors laid out and I have these actually at even increments. And then I just do the same steps that I did for that one and blend it all the way from top to bottom. Ta-da! We now have a shaded box. Um, if you're wanting to be slightly more dynamic than just a straight up and down gradient, you can choose a more specific direction to have the light shine from. So over here, I've got my dome, and instead of the white being directly at the top, I've actually moved it off to the side. Um, and you can see I've then laid out rings going radiating out from that spot to make my full gradient. And then this is what it looks like when it's shaded. Uh, I generally use this for domes just because it will make your domes look extra shiny and pretty. I don't tend to do a directional light when it comes to doing rectangles because then you get things like cast shadows on an entire side of the block as well as cast shadows on the ground and that's a lot more work than I'm willing to put into most things. Now something I have here is that uh, you may or may not want your lines to be straight all the way up and down. Um, so the reason for doing this is it's actually combining the method of doing regular shading with doing um, the local color shading gradient stuff. Um, it's if you want it to look a little bit more mottled or weathered or natural looking, then you could change the, the appearance of your lines and then shade from here. But you'll notice that that looks ex like an extreme difference before you blend it, but after the blending, you can barely tell, honestly. Um, but that gets more extreme depending on how extreme your lines are. Um, so that, that's something to keep in mind. So those are your basic shading rules to follow. Now let's talk about shadows. Shadows are, of course, when something blocks light from reaching certain areas. To determine where a shadow goes, you draw a straight line from your light source down to an object and then down to the ground or the, uh, the, uh, the thing, object that the shadow is being cast down onto. Um, again, I don't tend to do this for the full build but I'll add little details to the actual build itself. So here I've got basically my same rectangle idea up and down, and but I've added little things to have shadows cast from. Um, so we've got the window sills, we've got the decorative arches, um, and we've got the buttresses on the sides. Um, and then the first step that you're going to want to do is just put shadows underneath things that stick out. So the windowsills are pretty easy. You put shadows directly underneath them. Similarly, the arches, shadows directly underneath them, shadow under that ledge, shadow under there. Um, and then beyond that, what I also end up doing is to increase the contrast, I'll actually add some of my highlights back in to the front sides of those things um, just so that way they stand out just a little bit more. And then the next thing you want to keep in mind is you're making these buttresses. Uh, you're going to want to have each of the layers stand out a little bit more. So what you do is you have highlights at the top, shade down, highlight at the top, shade down. And it just makes 
things a little bit more dynamic where there's actually levels or tiers. Looks like I kind of forgot to do that one. Um, so that could actually use a little bit more of the highlights added into this one. So just gonna throw that in there. And then it looks more dynamic. Um, and then what you can do is then start putting shadows into cracks and recesses. So here I have uh, the crack being created by the buttress meeting the main building. So I end up putting more shading down there as well. And in the end, you, you know, compare something that had none of that shading to something that has all of that shading. This one looks significantly more dynamic than that one. And quite honestly, you can push the, the uh, contrast and little details of shading uh, to quite an extreme extent. You could keep going with this and make this as, you know, stark as you want it to be. Um, or you could find other little tiny shading details to add. It really depends on what you're comfortable with adding or not. And I find that this is a good way to make a boring flat build look more dynamic without just adding tons of stuff to your build. That being said, sometimes, especially if you have a smaller build you're working with, one of the ways to make the gradients blend a little bit better is by adding some bits and bobs to sit in front of the gradient. Your mind has a way of filling in gaps if it can't quite see everything properly. So if I find that my gradient is too distracting, sometimes I'll do a thing where I'll put something in front of it that partially blocks some of it. And something you may have noticed just from watching this video is that gradients can be really tiring to look at sometimes. I have a headache just from going through all of these gradients and showing them to you. Uh, <laughs> so when you're building, don't think that anything and everything needs a gradient. It doesn't. And staring at a bunch of different blocks mushed together can actually cause a bit of pixel fatigue. They're busy, they're crunchy, and sometimes a build will simply be better without the gradient. There's a fine balance to get things just right, where you can add subtle shading, but not make your build so messy as to make your eyes bleed. And some of that just takes time and experience to figure it out. Otherwise, I think that pretty well wraps up everything I wanted to talk about with gradients. I know it's all pretty basic stuff, but sometimes having a firm understanding of the basics is what enables us to grow. Heck, I'm still trying to improve upon my own technique, and honestly, I can mess with gradients all day and still not be 100% happy with it. But I know that experimenting with gradients has really improved my own builds, so I hope the same thing can be applied to your builds! Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully something in this video has helped inspire you. And until next time, I will see you later. Goodbye!